Hello. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Graham Ezzy. I'm a professional windsurfer. I'm on Maui right now, joined by Wave Traveler, <laughs> otherwise known as Paul. Yeah, hello. We're I'm not a professional uh, windsurfer, but I got a great coaching from a professional windsurfer and a friend so far. And we're in quarantine together, and we've been doing every Sunday around this time a live stream where we do live coaching. So uh, I encourage people to send in photos, videos, or questions, and then we discuss that on the stream. And it's been really fun, and it's been really successful. And so the PWA asked if I wanted to do it uh, this Sunday on the PWA account, and I agreed. This stream will be a little bit more general. I think we'll talk about some of PWA things that people asked uh, questions about, and then uh, we'll get into a bit more coaching as well later, later in, the, in the stream. So you guys sent in some questions, and I'm on the board of the PWA, uh, which might surprise some people because I've been in the past a pretty vocal critic of, of some of the actions of the PWA. And I got tired of complaining at a certain point, and I decided I wanted to step up and try to get more involved and try to fix or work on issues uh, that I wasn't happy with uh, and so be part of the solution rather than just complaining about it. So about four years ago, I ran for election to be on the, on the membership board, and I ended up winning a seat. And so I'm one of seven people who make the decisions for, for how the tour is run. And so the way that the PWA is set up is that it's a, a writer's organization at its heart. So the PWA was set up in response to a world tour that was being run by ad agencies, which then were not putting the writer's interests first, which meant that uh, the judging wasn't necessarily fair. It meant that prize money wasn't necessarily fair. Uh, it meant that the standards for the events uh, weren't fair for the competitors and for you know, the, the sustainability of, of good competition. So the current world tour, the PWA world tour, is run by a board that has a sailor majority. So there's a chairman who's elected and who is a sailor. Uh, right now it's Jimmy Diaz, and he's been doing it for, I think now almost 20 years. Uh, he's been doing a, a great job. Uh, and then on the, on the rest of the board, you've got three elected rider representatives and three brand representatives. So for the riders, it's, it's me and I'm the, longest serving uh, member at the moment, uh, Dieter van der Eiken and Lena Erdel. And then from the brands, you've got uh, Craig Gertenbach, Sven Rasmussen, um, and uh, Werner from, from JP. And so we try to make, make the decisions about how best, how best to guide the tour. And so what, what a lot of people don't know is it's, it's really rider driven, you know, we're a rider majority. And so whenever it comes down to a vote, the riders always have the power uh, to, to make what they want happen. Um, so you guys sent in some, some questions, which I've got now in front of me, and I'm going to answer. So someone asked what, what is the significance of the PWA? And so the PWA is the highest level of competitive windsurfing. Uh, and so it, it exists across multiple disciplines, waves, freestyle, slalom, uh, with foiling in there as well. And it's sanctioned by world sailing. And so world sailing is the body that you know, governs all of sailing. And so they sanction the PWA to give these world titles. And the PWA at its heart is a sanctioned body. It does other things as well. You know, it does its own media and marketing, and there are some organizational aspects. But at its heart, it's a sanctioned body. So the PWA is not 
organizing events, it's working with event organizers, saying, look, here are the standards that you need to have in order for an event to be a World Cup, and that requires uh, certain judges, certain judging criteria, requires certain formats, so that we have consistent formats across all events. Um, and then the PWA also provides crew, um, who are professionals who are really good at running events, uh, so that there's a consistency across, across all the World Cups. And so the organizers come to the PWA and they say, yes, I'd like to do an event. And the PWA says, all right, here's what you need to do. And then if those things are done, and an event happens and the PWA shows up, uh, which is different than what I think most people think, where the PWA would be organizing events on its own, uh, which is not the case. It's, it's primarily a sanctioning body. Um, so it, it's really important that we have local organizers in, in every location. So, um, like, sorry, like Ben, 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 free, ask, hey Graham, could we ever get a contest at Waddle again? Yeah, so Waddell is a great spot in California, Waddell Creek. And so could we get a World Cup there? I don't know. It depends on having a local organizer. So for all of these events, all of these spots, you need to have a local organizer who wants to put on the event. Um, and so for a lot of event organizers, that's either passion driven or profit driven. So some events make a lot of money and the organizers might not be diehard winter first, but they make the events as a business. Other events don't make money, but they're driven uh, by passion for the sport and put on by, by windsurfers who just love the sport. Waddell has some issues because it's so far from other population centers and also because of its park status. So I know in the past when the AWT was doing events there, there were some issues with the, uh, with the permits for the park. And so the thing is, is even if a spot is really good for windsurfing, it doesn't mean it's good for having an event because if it's, a, if it's a national park or a state park and there are different requirements for what can be set up there or what can be done, it can make it really difficult to have an event. Um, so there's all these other factors behind the scenes that are going on with every event. So it's not just like, oh, we've got a great wave spot or a great slalom spot, let's, let's do an event there. Let, let me ask you, can, like, like, like a lot of people are tuning in from all over the world, like from Sweden, from Argentina now, from Chile again, from Germany, from mm -hmm. the US. Um, I mean, it's a really, really big community out there. Is there an opportunity for the people like, like the guy who asked us um, to support the PWA on building, creating events like on, on some way, but because maybe they're like, hello Russia, Brazil is also here. Hey guys, <laughs> it's so cool. <laughs> We're so connected. Poland, yeah. Is there an opportunity for for them to? I don't know, like, if they have. Yeah, I mean, if, reach out if to yes, if if someone wants to organize an event or inquire about organizing an event, uh, they should contact us. Contact the PWA. Contact me. Contact Rich Page, who manages the tour, and discuss what that entails. Um, I think the budgets are a lot higher than what most people think um, because things cost money. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's great. I mean, it's you know, if if it's possible, any anyone can organize an event. Uh, and and again, the PWA sets the standards and uh, brings the the crew to run the event. Uh, but if if there's an organizer that that wants to make an event, that's that's perfect. That's what we need. So yeah, please reach out. Cool. Yeah. Are there any more questions? No. no so far, let like, the people saying hi because we like you know hey. we're, 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 yeah. we're asking them in our back. Where are you? Say hi, hi. So yeah, it's like Austria, Ireland. So a lot of people are. Um, I mean, yeah, that is a great question from Albert. Um, he asked for tips <laughs> for the triple. Forward Albert's asking for the triple forward tips. I think you just gotta sheet in. You just sheet in and go for it. <laughs> Uh, all right, so you, Love speed, yeah. you guys sent in some other questions as well on, uh, in response to the, the stories. So someone asked, how many spots are there? How many events are there on the ideal tour? And what we discuss 
internally is that about five to seven events per discipline. So seven, seven's a pretty good number. It gives, um, gives a discard, gives a good variety of spots and without being too many. Um, so it's because, you know, there's all these other aspects to a professional windsurfer's life, um, in terms of doing, you know, other events, regional events or photo shoots or, you know, all these other, other things that are requirements for being a pro. So we think five to seven events per discipline um, is is ideal. Okay, Ricardo's um, asking for tips about the body drag. Ricardo wants body drag tips. I think you want to keep your elbows down in the body drag. I think that's an important tip. Keep the weight on the boom so it transfers to the mast, which then transfers to the board. I think that's I think that's a good body drag tip. Um, all right, some more questions. Yes, yeah, so we can talk about back loops after after the PWA discussion. We've got we've got some coaching coming up as well. Um, so someone else asked, what what this what's the new star system for? So like I said before, the PWA is a sanctioning body, which means we set guidelines and requirements for events, um, certain standards um, that ensure that there's good judging, ensure that there's fair treatment of the riders and ensure that there's a sustainable aspect um, in terms of how the prize money is distributed uh, to sort of allow, allow riders to keep doing it, uh, to keep competing. So the top level World Cup has quite a high budget and that's limiting the number of events that we can do. So the star system is a way to try to get more events, to get new events by creating lower standard events that have less prize money, less judging standards, and count less towards the overall title. Uh, so for example, someone doing all of the uh, six star World Cups wouldn't have to do the lower star events. Um, but it means that there are more events on the calendar. And so that's really good for up and coming riders who might not get a place in all the events, or if they are getting a place, they're not doing very well, um, and so it gives them a chance to, to stand out and get points that contribute to the world title. And it also allows more riders to participate in that world rider, that world ranking uh, for the wave. So if we've got, you know, suddenly four or five more lower tier events, um, there's, I don't know, hundred or 200 people who will be on the world ranking that wouldn't previously. And it, it gives a better differentiation, especially for the places after the top 16, um, because there are fewer shared spots and it, it just allows for, it allows for a better, better world ranking, more events. Uh, so we get more publicity for the sport and the <clears throat> hope as well that these events can grow into full, full world cup events. Um, and it's also more entertainment for, for the people because like a lot of people are asking uh, what, what is happening with the 2020 season. I think we all are. Yeah, so that, that's something that just is up in the air. Like <laughs> everything else right now, we just don't know what will happen. Uh, so fingers crossed that, that we get the events, but don't know. Who knows what happens with, with the world in the next few months um, in terms of events. So I think everything is on hold more or less at the moment, right? Yeah, we're just kind of waiting, waiting to see. So we'll see what, we'll see what happens. Um, yeah. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Hopefully we, 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 we need it, right? Like we need the poser action, yeah. like the Maui action and yeah. Um, so we've got some questions about how to, um, how to enter the World Cup. So if you want to enter the PWA and you're a, a new rider, up and coming rider, how do you do that? So number one is to apply for a wild card. So at every event, there are wild card sailors who get a place and there's a committee who goes through the wild card. So it's important when you fill out the wild card application to really put in all the details um, that are, are relevant because when we're looking at the wild card applications, if you've put a blank application or a very sparsely filled out application, we don't know that much about you. Um, and so you're probably not going to get a wild card. So it's good to put 
what events you've done, how well you've done in other events. And if you've done well in national events or other big events, uh, that's, that's a, a pretty good sign. And you're often being in, you know, good contention for, for getting a spot. Now, not every event has the same demand. So there are some, some events that have, you know, I don't know, hundreds of applicants and we have to ch choose, you know, three or four people for the wild cards from, from this list of a hundred people. And there are other events that, you know, the list is maybe 10. And so if you email the PWA or, or ask us, we can say which events historically have more applicants and which have fewer. And then those, those events with fewer are going to be easier to get into. And then if you do all right in that event, then it almost guarantees that you'll get another wild card. You know, if you keep, if you keep doing well, then, then you're going to keep getting into the events. Um, so I think that's a good tip. Like not, not every event is the same difficulty to get into. Um, so talk to us, uh, reach out to us, ask us, ask us what we think and, you know, we'll, we'll be able to, to help, help there. Um, but again, it's, it's really good to get experience with regional events and local events and then go from there to the world tour. Um, you know, if you're 17 or 18 years old and you've done maybe one year of national racing, it might not be time to go to the world tour. It's, it, will be good to do maybe another year and, and you're getting on, when you're getting on the podium of your national events, then it's time to, to apply for the World Cup. All right, we're getting more questions. You want to check the questions, yeah. Paul? Yeah, the question is like, there's a little, uh, there's a little discuss discussion running like about what is easier, windsurfing or kitesurfing. Um, I've never tried kite, <laughs> ever. I learned that windsurfing 100%. <laughs> I think we all can totally agree to that. Um, I tried kitesurfing and I learned it in one day. I think it's so much easier, especially in the very beginning, to like make steps like planing and stuff like this and jumping and stuff. But then, like I think later in the evolution of windsurfing or kitesurfing, like when you compare it each mm -hmm. other, um, it's probably harder to like make proper moves, like you know, like back loops, like stall forwards mm -hmm. and like all the double variations, it's probably harder um, uh, or more complicated when surfing. But I think we are all here agree that windsurfing is the best sport <laughs> in the world. And um, it's good if we, let's say, keep the kiters away from our, <laughs> from our spot but sometimes. But the nice thing on Maui is there's no kiters really at Hokipa. I mean, sometimes, but they're pretty separate. It's unlike other places in the world where you've got kiters and windsurfers mixing. Uh, so that's kind of nice. Um, There's an, just one another question about like uh, da, 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 um, can you talk about a wave sailor planning a base board and sail quiver, keeping things simply to cover a wide range with not a lot of veer? Yeah, sure. So making a wave sailing quiver. So I think you want to have about three sails, and you can get away with one board. I would say choose something that is about five liters more than what your weight is. So if you weigh, say, 75 kilos, so that means that uh, a 75 liter board should be perfect buoyancy. So go five liters more than that. So go to 80, 80 liters. And that board should still uh, sail well when the wind is high, but it'll, it'll give you that extra flotation for the lighter wind days as well. So you're looking about five liters more than your weight, right? So 75 kilos translates to 80, 80 would translate to 85 liters. And then for the sails, a lot of people like to do, um, you know, like a even gap between the, the sails and the quiver. So like 404550 or 424752. And I actually disagree with that. And maybe we should do a video about this, Paul, because I think this is, this is a frequently asked question that I think most people are doing wrong. So the way that I look at it is you want 
to optimize your sale sizes for the conditions that you sell the most and you like the most. So for example, if I sell 70% of the time on either a 4.5 or a 4.7, and those are the, you know, the, the most, most days I get, so say something like, then you get a 20, four, six. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As you say. 20, 20, say like 20 to 30 knots, but there are some 10 knot days or 12 knot days that are amazing. Then maybe I would get a four, five, a four, seven and a five, eight. And so then a five, eight. Yeah. So for those really light wind days, so the, the, the point I'm trying to make is you don't need to go even in your spacing. So like, okay, four, five and four, seven means I'm on the perfect size for 70% of the days. And then on the really light days, I've got my five, eight. And then some days, you know, there's going to be, maybe I'm overpowered on the four, five or underpowered on the four, seven, but for the majority of the days, I'm on the perfect sale. And I think that's a better quiver than going say four, five, five, oh, five, five, where maybe the five, five is, is too small for the really light wind days. Maybe the, the five, oh, you're a little bit overpowered on most days where, but if you took the four five, you'd be a little bit underpowered. And so you really want to look at which conditions you're sailing in and which conditions you want to, you want to be sailing in, which conditions you have the most fun in. Um, you know, if you don't, if you don't sail a lot in the really high wind days, you maybe don't need a three, seven or, um, you know, if you, if you really like the high wind days, then maybe you don't need the bigger sizes. And so you really look at the number of days that you're sailing in. And we'll do a video on this because this is actually pretty interesting. Um, and I can throw some graphs in there as well to help with everyone who's a bit more math minded to, to picture this. Um, Paul, you want to check those questions? Looks like we're getting a lot of yeah, it's questions like, from you guys. Um, like the PWA. But what is about the boom and the mass setup? Like, like oh, for the boom and the mass. So you want to have good carbon mass um, and ideally, well, that's not true. I was going to say you want to go with a carbon boom, but you can go with an aluminum boom. It's fine. Um, and then if you get the chance to upgrade, I really recommend it. The nice, the nice thing with a carbon boom is it's so much uh, stiffer, you get a lot more response. It's a lot more responsive. And I think people don't buy carbon booms because of the cost. So I think they're about three times the cost of an aluminum boom, but an aluminum boom doesn't last that long. You know, at a certain point it bends or breaks, a carbon boom will last almost forever. Uh, you know, you can change the plastic parts out. If the grip comes off, you can re-grip it. So, you know, you, a carbon boom can last for 10 years, 15 years. So if you're, if you're looking at the economics of it, the carbon boom might be more expect, expensive upfront, but in the long term, uh, they're about the same cost and the performance is, is much, much yeah. superior. That's true. I mean, it's, it's more expensive. It's also more expensive to get a hundred percent carbon mast and like a light sail or a, a, and a light carbon extension, but it's, if you have a carbon boom, a carbon mass, a carbon extension, and a light sail, that makes such huge difference also on your wave sailing because it's so much lighter. I mean, it, it don't, doesn't make so many sense just to have a carbon extension mm -hmm. and then you have an aluminum mm -hmm. boom and a glass fiber mass. I mean, I use, I use a 90% carbon mass and I use the Ezzy mass and they never, well, knock on, knock on wood, and they never break. Um, and yeah, so I actually rec I recommend like a 90% carbon mass for, for windsurfing, 90, 91%, because uh, if you go 100% carbon, there's some lightness, but you are giving up strength and you don't want that in the waves. Uh, you don't want to be stuck somewhere with a broken mass, swimming in with currents. Um, so John Luca is just asking about again, like uh, when a PWA event in Italy, obviously not now, but we are waiting. Um, so great Italy. Yeah, it'd be great to have an event in Italy. Uh, like I said in the beginning, it, all we need is, is an organizer. So if you know someone that wants to organize an event, 
uh, or that is organizing events that wants to do a World Cup, uh, put them in touch with us and we'll, or the PWA, me, I can direct them to the right person and we'll tell them what, what the requirements are, what the budgets are, and uh, yeah, we'll go from there. That would be great. We'd love to have more, more events. Um, all right, I'm gonna get back to the questions that people are asking. So, what are the best trips, tips, the best tips for wave trips? So wave sailing, travel. I think that the number one tip is to go on a forecast. <laughs> so if you have the luxury of being able to, to plan last minute, go on a forecast. Uh, so you look, wait till it's windy, wait till it's wavy, and then you go. And that is the best way to travel uh, for wave sailing because you know that you'll, you'll be getting conditions. Now, I, I recognize that that's not possible for everyone. You know, we've got jobs, we've got other commitments. Last minute travel sometimes is more expensive. Often not though, uh, especially around Europe. Like if you're doing a trip to the Canary Islands, the last minute tickets, they're not really more expensive. So it's, it's not really a question of, of economics. Uh, but I do recognize that most people need to plan ahead of time. So then pay attention to the seasons, pay attention to the wind records, when it's windy, when it's good. Um, so like for example, Maui, if you come in January, it's often not windy. Sometimes it is, but it's often not. So don't plan your trip for them. Um, and so wind guru has good records of, of past forecasts that you can look at. You can go in their archives and yeah, check out the spot, ask the locals, ask the shops uh, about when it's good and then plan your trip in that window. And that will guarantee the best chance of getting conditions. And then for actually traveling, I like to travel with the least amount of equipment possible. So often I'll just take one board and maybe four sails. I've got a range covered, maybe a boom and maybe two masts. And you have to kind of find what works, what works for you, what your best, um, best setup is. I know some people can travel with just two sails and they're happy. Um, and yeah, you can also look into like rent different rental options if you don't want to travel with the gear. Though traveling with gear is not as hard as, as people think. The, the trick is, is you don't want the bags to be too heavy. So it's, I think it's better to have two medium weight bags rather than one heavy bag. And then always do your research with the airlines. Some airlines don't even take windsurf gear, like British do doesn't take windsurf gear. Other airlines have really great policies and you just pay for each bag or, or whatever it is for the set. Each airline has its own policy and it's really good to read that ahead of time because they each have their own specifics, right? So like some airlines want the bags less than 25 kilos, some want them less than 32. Some you're allowed three pieces or five pieces, some you're only allowed one piece. And so if you know the rules, you can pack, pack accordingly. And then it's, it's really not that hard uh, to travel with the windsurfing gear. I, I travel a lot with windsurfing gear and um, probably a lot of people um, already know it. Um, but what I al always do is like I'm checking in at the um, business um, check-in, like mm -hmm. at the business counter. Even though I'm just going um, on economy, um, but it's most of the time it's empty, and there's a lot of space. I'm asking really kindly and really friendly, like, "Hey, is it possible for my big bag to check in here?" Um, and like, I think 99% um, of the time I try it, it works, and the people are much more nicer. They don't like say, "Yeah, it's okay. It's the bag. It's a big bag," because they have yeah. I think, also more more power. To, to decide things and maybe are they also a little bit lazy or <laughs> yeah, at the business check. Yeah, that's, that's a good that's a good tip. And uh, and they don't really stand up and weight your your bags. So that helps me actually a lot, like um, to check in like to try at least to ask really friendly if it's possible to instead of going through like yeah. the big lanes with all the people with like like the three meter bags. Yeah. I think I think another tip you just you just remind me of this. Another tip is to bring a positive attitude to it. <clears throat> you know, the check-in agent has so much power 
the, the secret is that they can do whatever they want. They can make it so that you don't pay at all for your bags, or they can make it that your bags don't go on the plane. Yeah. They can say that they're too big. They have a lot of power, and a lot of times they don't realize they have that much power. But if you come with a positive attitude and you make them feel good, because they've got a tough job. They're dealing with passengers who are complaining the whole day. And so if, if you relate to them as a person and you treat them with respect and compassion, they'll often do the same to you. And that's what you need when you're traveling with, you know, basically couches, you know, these huge board bags. Um, so if you, if you approach them with positive attitude, with respect, with compassion, uh, they'll often respond in the same way and they have the power to, to do whatever they want. Yeah. Um, there's a few more questions. Someone's asking about upgrading boards. Is it worth it to upgrade your board every year or two? Good question. I think it really depends. I think if you have uh, like upgrading from the same board, uh, probably not, but adding a board to your quiver it maybe makes sense. So like, for example, I have a garage full of boards and they all do different things. So I've got boards for big waves, boards for small waves, boards for light wind, boards for high wind, boards for medium wind, free ride boards, freestyle boards. And they all sort of expand what's possible for me on a windy day. And that's a, that's a nice aspect of windsurfing. So, if you've got your 82 liter wave board that you love, no, I don't think you need to update it every year or every two years, maybe every four or five years or depending on, uh, you know, if, if you break it, obviously. Um, and there's, there's a lot of development that goes into, into the boards every year. Um, but if you have something that, that works, it works. You don't, need to, you don't need to upgrade it. But maybe you can get a, a 90 liter board and that opens up the light wind days for you. And, and then that's, that's a whole new world of fun um, and windsurfing is possible. And I would also um, say that, um, um, that it's good to work on your strap game and on your fin game, and like on all these little things, and little adjustments, little optimizations you can do, and you made some yeah. for so, that. Yeah, so I've been, this is something I've been talking about on my channel, which is just Graham Ezzy. You can follow me on Instagram, tune in with us every Sunday for the coaching, and then I, I'm releasing stuff also during the week. And we've been talking about setting up boards and you can make a huge difference to your board just how you set it up. And so it can feel like a new board, even if you're changing the straps, changing the fins. Um, all right, we're getting a question, tips for water starting. Yes, I have one big tip, which I don't know who told this to me or where I read it. It doesn't come from me, but it helps tremendously. And it's to put your chin down. So put your, put your chin on your chest when you're water starting. So you've got your boom. Put your chin on your chest, push the gear up, and that really helps. I don't know what it's doing necessarily, but put your chin on your chest, push the gear up, and don't, don't pull on the gear. Push the gear up. So the gear is bringing you up, you're not pulling yourself up with it. So keep your hips down. So you see people who are learning water starts and, and failing at them, and they're, they're, they've got their head up, they've got their hips up, and it's just too much weight on the sail. You want to think about being a vertical line. So put your chin down, keep your, keep your body in a V, and think about being a vertical line with your weight rather than horizontal, parallel with the surface of the water. And that will help, that will help your water starts. Someone's asking, do I know what's going to happen with the IWT? I don't know. So. No, he wants to know if you compete. Oh, if I compete on the IWT, well, I don't know which events are gonna happen. So I was wanting to go to the Japanese event. I love sailing in Japan, I love Japan. I've been going to that event since before it was an IWT event. It's a long-standing Japanese event. But obviously with the current Corona crisis, uh, who knows what's happening with events. Um, someone's saying, I don't understand the difference between IWT and PWA. Probably a good question. Generally, competitors do not participate in both. So they're different, different tours and with different goals. So the PWA is the highest level of windsurfing competition uh, for wave sailing, for slalom sailing, for freestyle, uh, for every discipline. And it, it's sanctioned by world sailing. Uh, the IWT is an unsanctioned tour. So it has uh, 
no, no sanctioning from a, a body like World Sailing. Um, and it started as a pro-am tour. It started as the AWT pro-am tour, uh, going around America, doing events uh, with amateurs and masters and pros as well, uh, as a grassroots tour. And it was, it, it, it still is very cool and the origins are very cool because it really just comes from this passion for windsurfing. Um, and I think it's, it's really good for the sport and really good for people uh, to have. It doesn't always, or it doesn't have the same standards in terms of, of judging and prize money uh, and standards for the sailors and media standards. So like every uh, PWA World Cup event has uh, the same format, it has the same elimination format. It has a pool of professional judges uh, that have to be at all of those events to ensure um, good, consistent judging. And then there's, of, of course, the prize money and, and other standards. Um, whereas with the IWT, uh, sometimes they're, or they're often, so they've got a um, great head judge, but they're often relying on, on volunteer judges, which is, I'm not saying, there's nothing wrong with that, I, but it's just a different standard. Um, it, it's, a, it's a less defined standard. So it's, it's a more amateur tour. And I, I don't mean that in any negative way. It's not that there's, because you know, the spots are really great spots and they've got really great riders. Um, but it's just that there's often no prize money or a lot less, less prize money and, um, uh, less, less defined standards, less defined, uh, formats and, and, and judging. And so what, what the PWA wants to do is to work with the IWT actually. Um, and we have been working with them. So the Aloha Classic is a partnership with the IWT and that's been working well. And, and we really would like to set up some of the IWT events to be uh, two or three star PWA events. Um, so they would, again, the PWA is a sanctioning body. So that doesn't mean that then the PWA is coming in and running these events. But what it means is if those events meet the standards, then they get the, the stamp of approval and they can count towards the world tour, um, which I think would be really good for the sport. And so that's something we're working on. And um, it's not super easy to do because the IWT tour has its own goals and, and they don't necessarily want to follow all of the standards. You know, maybe they want to put the money into to media instead of prize money, which is also totally fair. But um, you know, what, one of the things that we want to ensure with the PWA is that it's not a, a pay to play tour where if you're doing well, you can afford to go to the events and do the tour. You don't have to have money to do all the events. Um, so that kind of prize money distribution is important for us. Um, th there's just a lot of different aspects, but the, the IWT is doing a great job at, at building grassroots events and events in, in locations with great waves. And it's, it's a really cool team. You know, it was started by Sam Bittner, um, who's an American woman with just a huge passion for windsurfing. And now it's run um, by this guy, Simeon, who is a super cool guy, good wave sailor. Um, so there's a lot of passion there and it's just about figuring out the details on how to make it work. What do I think about foils and the next Olympics? I love it. I think it's really cool to see some innovation in Olympic windsurfing. I mean, for too long, Olympic windsurfing has been really removed from what most people do on a windsurf board. And I think putting the foiling in, is a pretty, pretty cool move. It's, it's gonna spice up spice up the Olympic discipline and I think it's good for the sport. It's also interesting. I yeah, think. it's super interesting. It's, it's good to have. All right, who has, a, who has a ride if way? One surfer? The wing surfer or the wind surfer? So... The wind surfer? No, that's not true. The surf, surfers always have the right of way. Yes, I have a situation. Yeah. Like surfer, wing surfer and me as a wind surfer. Yeah. So the, the wing surfer one, I don't know because that that's so new. So wing surfing here on Maui sometimes is considered kiting, which I don't know if is totally fair, but generally the surfer always has the right of way. So you want to give room to surfers, 
don't sail upwind and spray them in the face when you're going by them. If a surfer's on a wave, even if you were on the wave first, you gotta give priority to the surfer. Uh, it's really important to give respect to surfers and swimmers and everyone who's on a less maneuverable craft. Now, I agree. Um, what I'm gonna say next might be a little bit controversial and it depends on the spot, but I'd say that windsurfing is the less maneuverable craft uh, compared to uh, kiting and that kiting, uh, kiters need to give right away to windsurfers, which is also just a basic respect thing as well because the kiters, they can get around better in light wind, they can catch all the waves. It's kind of like the long border at the surf spot. Um, you know, he, he can paddle for every wave but that's not the right etiquette. It's, it's good to give, give, uh, give waves to, to the guys windsurfing. And so I think the windsurfers have priority over the kiters. So Mark is asking, how will the rules for the new slalom format be decided? Um, can I answer that? Right? Oh, I'm, I'm not really sure what you mean about the race, about format. So anyway, we're, we're integrating uh, foiling into into the slalom, so you've just got one one racing discipline, which I think would be really cool. You can find all the rules um, on the PWA site. Um, all right, can you recommend some exercises yeah, to learn? Yeah, let's jump into some coaching, right? Like sure. I'd love to. Like, okay. So yeah, like can you recommend some exercise to learn some power jobs. All right, so someone's asking, how do you set up your boom for? wave sailing. Um, I put it lower than I normally would. I think you want it like at your chest level. Um, the lower your boom is, so like if you've got your boom high and you're, you're pressing on it, you can't really get the rig over very far. Um, whereas if you're pressing on the bottom, you have a lot of, a lot of power to push the sail over um, and you can really get on the rail. And I think that's, that's pretty important. Um, someone asked about practicing power jibes. I think you want to have a wide grip on the boom that helps you load the sail and that then helps you load the rail. So what I think can be really useful whenever you're thinking about carving is to think about tipping the board over. So instead about turning the board sort of on one plane, you want to think about getting the board on its side. So you get a wide grip push hard on your back leg, trying to tip the board over and then scissor your legs. And I think that's the best, best technique for, awesome. for power drives. Yeah, and bend your knees, bend your knees. Yeah, that's a huge one. Yeah. Then you're getting the drive, drive into the board. And speed. I see a lot of people are there and not on the end of the day. You need like speed, yeah. Um, all right three, four, or five batten sail. For me, I like four batten sails, um, but three, four, five batten sails have their benefits. I also think it's a mistake to look at the number of battens as the most defining characteristic of a sail, because within those categories, there are wild differences in how a sail feels. So the specific sail is more important maybe than the number of battens that it has. Um, all right. Harness lines. So I use 28 inch harness lines, which is a little short compared to other people, but I like my harness really loose. So I've got this really loose harness that then kind of rides up and out, which then accommodates for the difference in, in harness lines length. But generally you want your harness lines to be at least the length sort of from the top of your hand down to the bottom of your elbow. Um, and so that's, that's sort of a minimum go-to length for your harness lines um, for wave sailing. Yeah, and then so someone's asking, do you have to change the length of the harness lines? I would say once you have them set and you're comfortable, you don't have to change them. Um, but again, it comes down to comfort, personal preference. Uh, it's good to make sure the harness lines are in the right place. One way you can do that is when you're standing on the beach and you hold your boom with two fingers and you find the point where the sail can balance there. And that's generally where you should put your harness lines because that's the point where uh, you, know, you, can, you can hold all the way to the sail just with the harness. Uh, all right, let's see what other questions there are. Um, what's the best spot I've ever windsurfed? That's um, a good question. 
home. <laughs> yeah, Hokipa is yeah. pretty amazing. You know, Hokipa is not the best, best, but is most consistently the best. So the that waves are not crazy. the cleanest but they're still pretty clean. The waves are not the longest, but you can get two or three turns. It's got good sections for turns, for tricks, for aerials. You can even jump sometimes. Um, all right, someone's asking about single fin. Um, single fins are great. Um, I, you know, they have a lot of speed and a lot of power and a lot of uh, drive. You know, if you're going to then transfer from a single fin to a multi-fin board, I really like thrusters because I think the thruster has a lot of the characteristics of a single fin while having the extra maneuverability of a multi-fin board. Uh, for me, quads can be fun, but I really prefer a thruster. I like having that extra depth, which gives me a bit more drive, a bit more security, um, makes it so that I slide out less. Uh, and that when I do slide out, I can find the fins again more easily. I'm using K4 fins. Uh, someone asked the question. So I use my own pro model, the Ezzy's, uh in 10 on the sides, and then I use uh, 17 or 18 in the rear, and I'm using the Scorcher fin, and it depends on the spot. So in some spots, I like to use a bigger fin if there's more current. I'll use the 18, and other spots, I'll use the 17. Um, I get, we were talking a lot about back loops and, and uh, we're, you know, doing coaching and normally on my stream, on my channel, uh, every Sunday we're doing coaching where people send in photos and videos and we discuss them and people ask questions and you can uh, tag I do my tips. your videos. Yeah, tag your videos, tag me in your videos and I'll talk about it on the stream and I'll, I'll give you personal feedback as well. Break it down. Break it down. Line. Yeah, and as long as we're quarantined, um, <laughs> I'm happy to give as much feedback as possible because there's not a lot else going on. And I'd love to give back to everyone who's stuck at home. Um, so for using coaching, this is something that Paul and I were talking about because I've been, I've been helping Paul out. And you said the other day you were getting a bit frustrated, right? Yes. You, you want right. to explain that? Yeah, so it's like, um, yeah, frustrated like with my development, like with the, because I'm, I'm working on it, I'm just, uh, um, how do you say, like, um, in German we say like, like we stuck on a certain level, mm -hmm. like, and there's like we, on a plateau, we mm -hmm. say, um, but there's a different word for it. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm really getting frustrated of like learning or yeah, like riding the waves and not having really a, um, a proper development. So on my cutbacks, on my bottom turns, mm -hmm. I feel like I'm 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 stuck in my like on my skill level, on my techniques, mm -hmm. on my abilities. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah, that was like a very frustrating moment, like when you see, okay, that's not really going, mm -hmm. um, like, f f further, like. Right. So, I think there's a few, few things that you can do to kind of get out of a rut. So first of all, so something that you said to me, which I think is really wise, which is that it doesn't make sense to train every day with the wrong technique. Um, and you were talking about, you know, your own sailing, and, and it applies to anything, whether it's basketball or, or anything else. But I think it's it's really important to make sure that when you are on the water, that you're you're training with the right technique, that you're not every day going for back loops off the wrong waves or through sixties off the wrong section, or you know, trying to train, learn the forward loop when you're underpowered or overpowered. So making sure that the fundamental conditions are correct is really important to learning new moves and to, to progressing with your sailing. So for example, like if, you, if you're trying to learn the back loop, it's really important to take off on the steepest part of the wave. If you're taking off where the wave is sloped, you're not gonna get the right projection. Uh, you're not gonna go at the right angle and it's just not gonna work and you're not gonna learn. Uh, same, if you're trying to learn forward loops when you're overpowered, it's 
not gonna work. You're gonna be scared. You're gonna have too much, too much power. The same if you're underpowered. So you wanna, when you're learning anything new, you wanna have sort of the right power and you've gotta make sure it's the right conditions and that you're not forcing it, that you're, you're doing it in the right place. Um, I think that that's really, really important. Yeah, that is so true. Yeah, I mean, that's like the story I, I told you like when I was in Santa Monica, right? So yeah, yeah I was in Santa Monica like for uh, two weeks and I was playing like training on my on my hoops, like uh -huh. on, my, on my basketball game. And I was like throwing balls after ball and um, yeah, there were there were a guy standing mm -hmm. uh, like sitting on the on the park mm -hmm. bank, and he was just watching me for half mm -hmm. an hour, like covered in his base cap and behind his sunglasses. And um, on one point, like after ha half an hour, he came to over to me and said, like, "Hey, listen, um, it looks okay what you are doing, like, and your shooting is quite nice, but let me give you like a like a really quick um, like tutorial, mm -hmm. like a really quick." coaching on um, like a couple of just little adjustments you can do. So he said, okay, let's first go shoulder wide, like lock your arm and then goes like, so he gave me like, like three to five little mm -hmm. tips and little adjustments. And he said the guy, the name of the guy was artist, like artist, like just with a D. And he said like, you know, he exactly said like, hey, um, you know, it looks really good what you're doing, but it doesn't make sense when you come here every day, practice and train shooting with the wrong technique. Right. So on one point, you absolutely will lose the game, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so that makes, it makes more sense to, from the beginning, to work on your fundamentals mm -hmm. and train um, with the right techniques. Mm -hmm. So, like on the long term, you um, will have more joy and more fun, like and more appreciation on on the game at all, and um, I think that also really fits also for windsurfing because I think as like most of the windsurfers, mm -hmm. like ninety nine percent of of us are um, have like there we are in shape, mm -hmm. we have like we have a good capability, we have you know we are mm -hmm. athletes kind mm -hmm. of it's an extreme sport so. Um, a lot of things are a mind game. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I think with like, and we we talked about like a couple of days ago, like um, that I think a lot of people, like including myself, training the wrong moves in the wrong um, conditions. Mm -hmm. Like you know, there's not really often like um, I don't know, like like on the Baltic Sea, for example, maybe I mean you definitely can learn front loops but mm. like you have to take the wind wave so mm. like the direction of the launch is like kind of strange but it's super nice to practice back loops for example because right. you are jumping right. already into the wind um like the other day on your coaching life coaching i think mm -hmm. it was the last time last yeah. sunday the guy was asking about like how to do aerials mm -hmm. in in on the baltic sea mm -hmm. Which we both agree, it's kind of um, um, yeah, it's it's definitely right. manageable, but it's also hard on on, on the Baltic mm -hmm. Sea because then it and yeah, then what we said is it's better in those conditions to work on your backside aerials, and actually working on the backside aerial will help with the frontside aerial because you're getting more familiar with the waves and the timing and the placement. Um, so the takeaway tip there is that you really want be working on moves that fit the conditions. So if it's not a back loop day, don't do back loops. But maybe it's a day for working on your, your wave riding fundamentals or frontside aerials. Or if it's not a day for frontside aerials, maybe it's for backside aerials. Or maybe it's for forward loops. You know, it's, it's really important to focus on what is ideal for the conditions. Because if you're trying to force it, it's just not going to work. Um, Someone's asking, do you, what do I use for boards in terms of volume? So I'm about 85 kilos and I have an 82 liter and an 88 liter board that are my go-tos. I also have some 90 and 95 liter boards, but I find that I can use the 88 liter in very light wind. Um, so unless it's, it's more onshore, then I'll go to like a, a 93 liter board. Uh, and I use probably I'd say the 82 and the 88 about equal. 
Um, so if, if I feel like I need a little bit more volume, I'll take the 88 and I'm super comfortable on it. Uh, and if it's a little bit windier, um, I'll take the, the 82. And that doesn't necessarily mean anything about sail size. So I can be sometimes on the 88 on a 4.7 if it's kind of gusty wind with big holes. Or I can be on the 82 on the 5.0 if it's really consistent wind. And I know that I'll always be fine with the 5.0 in terms of power. Um, you know, having a little bit of extra flotation is good when the wind drops. It also can be good when the waves are really big uh, because you get a lot of current and you get situations where if you're on a small board, maybe you get stuck and you don't want to get stuck when the waves are big because then maybe you're in the, the danger zone, the impact zone. Um, I want to say a few more things about using coaching. Uh, so, like, when we're doing these these live streams and we're doing the coaching or when you're reading about tips you know there's a lot of great tips in the magazines and online it's great but you want to use that advice sparingly if you focus too much on the coaching and on the tips you're too much in the left side of your brain and then when you're in the water you're not able to execute because you're thinking too logically. You're thinking in the, the logic side of your brain rather than in the action side of your brain. And so it's important to really digest the material, but then when you're on the water to be a bit more free with it. And there are a few different techniques for how to do that. So like one way is to have like a, a rhyming device or like a mantra that you can say. Uh, so it can just be as simple as just sheeting in the key element, or sorry, just repeating the key element of what you want to do. So maybe that's sheeting in on the for loop. And so you're just repeating to yourself, sheeting in, sheeting in, sheeting in, sheeting in, sheet in, sheet in, at, or reach back, reach back. And you're just repeating that element and it becomes like a song where it loses some of its like logical meaning. And so it becomes a bit of a rhythm, a bit of a mantra. And so you can be in the the right side of your brain, which is more, you know, action, action oriented. Um, so like when I was wave sailing, when I was like 16, I broke my ankle, I broke my leg on an air taka. And when I was coming back from that injury, um, my dad came up with a, a mantra for me to help, help with the sailing. Cause I, I was really having mental issues cause I, I knew what I wanted to be doing, but I wasn't able to do it because I'd been injured and I was out of the water for three months. And so it was, I was applying the logic, but I wasn't able to get into my body and, and just react. And so it was humble and flow. And so I was just I was repeating that to myself in the session. And that helped remind me, you know, not, not to force it and to just be in the flow with the waves. And, th and that really helped me come back from that injury. And so for every, every move or every tip, if you kind of isolate some of these aspects and I know some coaches like Jem Hall, they come up with these like rhymes um, for their tips and, and those can be really good because then it's something that, that is logical but it's, it's also existing in, you know, in the right side of your brain. It's more kind of a song, poetry element to it. It's, it's less of this like logic language. Um, cool. I think we are... You're coming to an end. Yeah, we're coming Slowly. to the end. That went so quick. Um, like always. Though. Yeah, every Sunday we're doing this. And, you know, if we get more people watching, we'll start doing it more frequently as well. On your account, right? Yeah, like, so uh, it's all on my account. So you can see it here somewhere <laughs> at Graham Ezzy. And uh, I'm also posting tips throughout the week and videos. And ask me questions. So ask whatever you want and I'll answer it or make a video about it. And also tag me in your photos, tag me in your videos. And this is I'll so critique cool. them. Like people really love it if you go through the videos of the guys or of the photos and then giving some tips on wave Yeah, saying. thank you. That is yeah, this is really just, just, this came from the quarantine experience <laughs> where uh, I know that a lot of people are stuck at home right now and you know, we, we just wanna give back um, and give as much to the community push as we can yeah and so our uh the live streams are, are wave sailing focus because that's what what my focus is uh but we can talk about anything you know it's it's guided by what you guys want so ask questions tag me in your videos and uh yeah 
see you next Sunday. Um, so keep keep tagging me, keep asking questions. Back loop and time, yeah. Back loop time. Yes, back we'll <laughs> Yeah, we'll talk more about back loops next time. And I think I'm gonna start doing some videos too. So